So the first thing to, to start with is A New Jerusalem. And this is a piece that I produced for a solo show called um, Decoding the Apocalypse, which was at Somerset House a few years ago. Um, and this particular piece is how, I guess, Gazelle and I got to know each other, and so far as that it won the Lumen Prize uh, two years ago in the VR art category. Um, and in many ways, what, what this piece does is it actually takes this idea from the book of Revelations about this fantastical city that has never existed and you know, may never exist, and brings that into some kind of experiential form. And you know, artists have actually tried to do this through the ages, uh, I, would, I would actually say unsuccessfully, because it's always been about creating some kind of physical thing. Whereas, you know, Revelations and the idea of a new Jerusalem, it's a very sort of visceral, conceptual space. That, that, you know, that text is trying to bring you into. So I thought, you know what, virtual reality, that's actually the nice match, that's the right medium. So this and this idea of a new Jerusalem being an imaginary city is, is in many ways kind of the conceptual seed for this body of work, which I've then been growing with the British Library as their artist in residence in the digital scholarship um, group. So if we move from there over to the prints out here. Imaginary cities, the idea was um, when I met the people from Digital Scholarship uh, for the first time, one of the things that really kind of amazed me was the digital collections that they were actually setting up. In particular, the one million images from Scan Books collection, which is basically, I mean, Mahendra and other people here, Adam, can tell you all about that, but the short of it is, is that um, big project with Google to scan all these books, take the images out, and then they decided, Google decided they didn't want them. What? Oh, sorry, Microsoft, sorry, yeah, Microsoft <laughs> decided they didn't want them, gave them to the BL, and Digital Scholarship basically put them on Flickr and gave them to the world for free. And I just thought this was amazing, and it's this amazing sort of resource um, and that kind of merged with an idea that I was interested in working with maps, in historic maps. And kind of, it was around the time I was doing the, the uh, New Jerusalem piece, and I was thinking about, oh, well, you know, could I actually take old maps, old sort of data about cities, and create something that was actually new, something that was algorithmic, something, you know, for the contemporary age, but was unapologetically based on our history in sort of an, an analog artifact, because there are, I wouldn't say a lot, but there are a good number of artists that are working in sort of a digital arts practice that use contemporary data sources to make contemporary sort of artifacts and experiences. And yeah, I've done that, but kind of been there, done that. So I wanted to do something different, so this idea of going back in history. So with that in mind, I started talking with Mahendra and, um, and others there at, at the BL, and they offered me a residency, which was great to kind of explore this idea of, of taking those historical resources and then creating new works from them. Um, and one of the things that I was really kind of hoping to do through this process is not only end up with like a new body of work, um, but also to actually expose to the public sort of the beautiful infrastructures and the stuff that's been going on in the at the BL and other sort of institutions through this process of sort of digitization where we sort of have these analog collections, we are digitizing them, we're making them available for the public online, so on and so forth. And I thought that was a really kind of interesting story that this work could kind of frame. So these studies here um, are taken from that, that archive 
So the first thing I had to do was actually learn how to data mine the archive, because there are a million images. Um, I wanted to get maps out, but not only maps, city maps, city maps of a certain size, a certain sort of quality, and so on and so forth, and use that you know, as part of the exploration process. So I worked with Mahendra, with his colleague Ben, to actually learn how to effectively data mine the image set, which should be easy, but it actually ended up not being so easy. Um, but in the end, we got there, and I then curated a subsection of maps to use. And then I started going through and developing processes of ways to transform these maps. So algorithmically, so not me sitting there making decisions, but actually saying, let's build up an algorithmic process, and let's actually put it through the process and see what happens. So the first thing here, um, these are in sets of three. So there are three different examples. You have New York, um, Paris, and London. So three different sort of historic maps, um, from all from, I believe they're the early sort of 1830s sort of time frame as well, um, from Guy Fawkes, interestingly, sort of like the, um, the, the Google Maps of that sort of day and age. So where the first one you'll, you'll see here, we'll say process one. So what that is doing, it's going, the server application is going um, to the map live online and then saving the information and then taking out two samples from that according to a certain set of instructions and compositing those together. So that's process one. From process one, then the next layer <coughs> to create that, then the next layer actually creates this city plan Mandela out of that. That's process two. And then here, just to show the detail, because even though the maps are, say, maybe three megapixel images, once the process is done with them, they end up being around mm, 32 megapixel images. So they get scaled up, they get transformed. At a distance, they look very analog, but when you get closer, they start to look more and more digital. So again, that's kind of one thing that I wanted to play with. Another thing to point out on these, for anyone that has a smartphone, um, and if you, let's see, go to my barcode reader, you'll see, you'll notice in my signature here, below my signature, where you actually have some metadata that's just like when I printed the study, um, you know, what the city was, so on and so forth, but you actually will have a QR code, which, if we scan that, and then we go, and that actually takes you back to the original map, live from the collection on Flickr. So this idea, because one of the things that, again, you know, for, for me, I don't like to have an artwork, because at the end of the day, I'm trying to produce ideas for a body of work. Um, I don't want to have a ream of text by the artwork, but for me, the, 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 the research, the connection to the historical material, to the you know, to the work that the BL has done to lead up to this, those kind of cultural assets are very important because without them, the work doesn't exist. So how can I explicitly start linking that into the work? So this idea of using, you know, something that everyone has access to because everyone has a smartphone. Where I'll probably take this further is I'm thinking about, because if these would end up being framed prints, that actually, you know, taking the barcode and making other sort of metadata barcodes and making a frame so you, you have a printed frame within a frame configuration, something like that, things that I'm thinking of. So please touch them. You know, you can just pull on the side where the, the board, but you have a New York example. You have a Paris example here um, and such. And then you've got a London example. Now, the moving over to this table, um, this is an example from a London map. Now, one of the things that I also wanted to do was play with this idea of time. So, the physical artifacts that these come from, the, the, the actual books, they are static, absolutely analog, like I said, physical things, um, which I love. But this idea, if I'm then producing a physical thing from a physical thing, 
yes, it's, you know, it's through a digital process, but can I actually come up with a way to make it live in some way, you know, to take that sort of, um, uh, use the idea of the iteration and such. So these processes, the other thing to say is that all this, all the processing is being done online through a server application that I'm uh, working on with, well, I'm a, I, I conceptually designed it. My colleague and friend, David Steele, who's a, a software architect in the US, he's the one doing the sort of the coding and the heavy lifting. Um, and what we've designed is a system that basically, it's a, it's a, it's a Java application plus a database. So it goes and captures, I say, okay, I want to curate this particular image from the archive. So in this case, the London map, <coughs> um, a specific London map. So the, the application goes and it captures that and saves that image because that image never changes. Um, but then I wanted to, in a sense, create a new manifestation of that reimagined city plan every day, one a day. Um, that would just run forever. Now, I thought, okay, well, I always want to have change every day, um, but I also want sort of to reflect how the digital archive itself is always in flux and unstable because it has metadata tags, it has user you know, views, different kind of counters like that, that those are changing in, in the sort of the rich information um, sort of cultural material, if you will, the scholarship and knowledge that surrounds that asset is always growing. So how can I reflect that? You know, doing, doing the both. So what we've, do, what we've done is in our algorithmic process of transformation, you get, if you think of like small change occurs on a daily basis. So we take the sampled area and basically what we do is the, the, the two areas that are getting sampled sort of slightly shift over time, just as time progresses. But then you get different transformation values when, say, the metadata changes or the, the view count. So all of a sudden, you can have a very slow change, and then you have a sequence of different changes. And when I say changes, it's like not only sample area, but we play with the histogram, we play with like how the, the, the different sort of source samples are being recombined to make the final composite texture, which then gets transformed to the Mandela. Um, so this actually kind of shows the progression. So here we have, um, actually, let's reverse. We start back here. We've got, um, this is one of our tests. So this is a live test, all it's been processed. So this is day one, and this is day seven. Now they're very similar, but if you start looking at certain things, you can actually say, yeah, they're definitely, but, but the changes are small, because this is just a week. So this is with no metadata changes. No, we just wanted to start sampling like this idea of rate change over time. So between day one, day seven, you get minor, but certainly noticeable changes. And if you see it in an anima animation, it becomes very kind of obvious. But by day 32, it's very different. Sort of moved on. But you do still have aesthetic similarities. And then as you sort of shift on, this is day 366, so you know, the first day into the simulated new year, we're again, you know, a very different thing. So this idea of every day the new piece is sort of formed and sort of continuously sort of changing. Um, because even though in the end it's a physical print for, for people that like material process, so this is 100% um, cotton, very specialized art paper, special coding for digital inkjet work, the ink sorts of, um, it's a um, eight color pigment based system, uh, and so on and so forth. I really like my process. Everything <laughs> that is, uh, is of my own hand. I, you know, I, I constantly sort of flip back and forth between wanting to work wholly digitally, getting fed up with it, and then wanting to work wholly, you know, in the analog manifestations of the digital, and then I get pissed off with that. And, Go back. <laughs> so moving on from there, if we go to here, I'll show you where where that kind of work is. So these two pieces here, um, I did these. This is from a Paris map, and again, it's actually one of the ones that has been printed out on the paper because I wanted to like you know actually make the thread easy to follow. Um, so 
if those could be seen on like a line of an edition work or you know sort of the print based work then of course in a fine art context one is always thinking about the the single the the precious artifact and and for me the reason i wanted to do that was really you know i don't make things just because you know they're they're pretty and nice and people want them on their wall but I, I thought, you know, conceptually, thinking about maps and the histories of maps, that maps used to be, you know, very precious. And indeed, I was talking about <coughs> one of the things I learned from the curators, um, the map curators at the BL, was that the guidebook maps that I was actually using as my source material were not, were of course based off of grandiose, really kind of specialized maps that, you know, people would pay to have access to. And then they, you know, in the guidebook, it would be, the little kind of sketch, if you will, that was for print of this like really beautiful, expensive map. So I, I wanted to get back to that idea of the singular and the precious and materiality. So I thought, okay, well, maps, printing, what about gilding? So I didn't know how to gild, so I decided to teach myself how to do traditional gold, metal, leaf gilding and such. And these are the results. So what I wanted to do was to, to take those digitally processed images, to take one of them, and then to basically take the finest materials you could have actually have. So this, from a material standpoint, all the board is 100% cotton, like pigment-based, museum, you know, basically the best sort of cotton sheet, thick sheet board you can get. On top of that, I, I basically then had to modify the historic process of gold gilding. So I started with the kind of the historic, because it's, you know, it's, you know, millennia old, the process of gilding. So I learned the traditional way to do gilding, but then I had to adapt it because to take the digital image, um, what I've used is a process that's a digital direct media process using the latest gen um, of, it's a, it's a Swiss, uh, half a million pound machine, which I actually happen to know a firm that has one and they <laughs> like my work. Um, so I, I basically spent uh, a few afternoons with the director's sons who actually love the machine and we sort of doing experiments to figure out how we could actually get these ultra high resolution um, digital images to permanently print onto, in this case, this is solid gold and this is solid silver and such. And then thinking about sort of the whole way to frame them, present them, so on and so forth. Um, so yes, this is so, this is the, again, they're, they're, they're prototypes, they're changes <laughs> I want to make. Uh, the, the one most annoying thing in this is that um, originally I had, I have very nice sort of museum or anti-reflective, really high quality glass, which basically kind of disappears in the rock light right lighting and all you see is the object. Um, and then it was so fragile, I was sitting there like, I was like, this is gonna get broken <laughs> because it's, you know. So I, I, I basically replaced it with acrylic. Um, so please look past that. Um, but again, sort of this idea of, of this being very much a show and tell sort of thing and wanting to get, um, one of the things, this is a test, so this is the silver on the cotton board, which has gone through a process. Um, and I've only lightly protected it, because one thing I needed to do was see how durable the material is. Because again, it's, it's not really, you don't normally gild onto paper. You actually gild onto like wood, metal, things like that. Um, so how can I actually get it to work onto a cotton board paper? How could I actually protect it in a way? Because <laughs> Mahendra knows this. The first silver test I did, um, it, it, it went to hell in a handbasket. As I sort of, I, I'm, I'm very, very good with mechanical process. And I started trimming it, and it just started splintering because basically the lacquer interaction with the, um, the linseed oil for the gilding and everything just started to fall apart. So it was like, okay, step back, go to bed, have a mm -hmm. dream, think about how can we overcome this, this process to actually make it work because the idea of, you know, having to print with bleed to trim out to have this perfect, perfect object, you know, things like that. Um, but then as I started sort of researching things, like here is a little swatch card of 
different types of materials in terms of gilded materials. Um, in the end, this has been done with pure silver. This has been done with 23.5 karat gold. I, I decided to go for that for two reasons. The first was because historically, 24 karat gold I don't think really existed in gilding because of course you couldn't actually have pure gold. Um, the other thing is from a material standpoint, it gives a slight better sort of strength to it, even that like 1%, which allows the gilding technique, and especially when I'm doing really harsh digital process things to it, to actually withstand, let's call it the impact of, of, of going through that. But one thing that I was thinking about is um, I would love to actually, with a researcher who knows historical gilding, to talk about, well, actually, what were the metal combinations that were really used, and can I get a modern day equivalent? So I could actually say that this here is based off of something, you know, this is a map of, based off a map of Paris from the 1830s. And at that time, this was the kind of gilded process in terms of the metal composition, you know, it's those little geek Easter eggs that I have <laughs> and, and such. So, so please, you know, feel these things and such. And then, you know, then even other things like I was, talking about with Vic Victoria and, and Mila in terms of like framing the work because for me, the frame, the presentation, you know, it is all, it is all the artifact, it is all the piece, um, actually in this way technically, um, because it's in a sense, it's all glued together. I mean, yes, you can disassemble the frame and so on, so, but it's, it's very much part of the artifact. So originally, I wanted this really thin profile but then, when I had the really nice art class in it, I started to notice, you know what? At an oblique angle, you actually see the line of the glass because glass has a cut edge. You know, weirdly, you don't actually see it on the acrylic because the acrylic has a saw on, in a sense, sheen edge, and it disappears. But with a really nice glass, you see the edge, and it was really annoying me as well. I was like, oh, yes. how does one actually get around that? Because it's those little things, because, you know, thinking about the whole artifact. So, do I actually move to a different framing system, still do the box, sort of shadow box framing, um, with this and a separate aluminum channel in the center, but then make the frame thicker and increase the border and such. Um, so again, don't know. <laughs> you know, things, things, to, things to think about in the ideal world. The, the other thing I was wondering, and again, um, I'm very much into, Signing my work, not because I want people to sit there and like fixate on my signature, um, but because again, kind of the statement that this is the one-off. This is from my hand. This is, this is, you know, it is not just some random digital thing. I mean, to to be honest, I mean, like I said, to to go through the process of producing these, we kind of I had to kind of research a new process to to make the whole thing work. Insofar as when the prints actually came off the machine the director of the company that owns the machine, he was just looking at me and he was amazed. And he was real, I mean, he just smiled and he, you know, because he and uh, myself and his oldest son were just there and he was like, he was like, this is amazing. Like, I was like, yeah, I, I was like, we, we have like slaved over sort of adjusting hardware settings on your machine for the last sort of four hours to find the right ink <laughs> consistency to actually get the best image that's also durable and so on and so forth. So it's not a, it's, it's very much when you're actually working with machinery on a hardware level, in that level of detail. So, so many things go into it that, yeah, it definitely needs to be signed, but I didn't want to destroy the aesthetics by just having my signature there. Um, so in the end, for these prototypes, I decided, uh, let me just pull up my gallery, they're actually signed on the reverse. <laughs> now, of course, they're, they're, they're hidden, but then I was thinking, okay, well, these frames do have a channel, so I could actually, um, you know, actually put a glass back on the reverse, so someone could actually see the signature so it doesn't get lost but then I just really now overthinking things. <laughs> but for me, somewhere conceptually it's born that, no, they needed to be signed. They needed to be signed because I needed to actually make the point that this is not just something off of a digital production process, but is truly a one-off. Because there is so much of my hand in this, even though if you take away the computer, you have nothing, 
if you take away my hand, you also have nothing. So it's that weird kind of combination between the digital and the physical. Okay, and then this, the, the screen paste piece here. Um, so the 2D physical works are very much about kind of creating these aesthetic imaginary city map plans, you know, maps in a sense, imaginary maps or map-like entities that are based on maps. Whereas I thought, okay, well, can we actually push that further? And kind of in the line of New Jerusalem, can we actually start making things that are experiential um, in a virtual space? So, because like I said, the images that are getting produced on the server application, you get a one, a new one each day. Can I actually, and those are going to be online, used as assets in their other right, can I work with someone to create a virtual environment that draws those in, in real time, <coughs> now this, as it's booting up, this has been done in collaboration with Drew Baker, who's uh, he's now in Australia, but uh, while he was here in England, I mean, he's one of the gods of sort of online 3D, certainly in the digital humanities, digital archaeology world. So this is taking one of those images, it's pointed in, and as you see it fading in, what's actually happening is that the Unity 3D engine is basically creating a new bitmap which is being actually read from that, that live image. Values are being read. Now you see this here. Now this, this is a technical study. Aesthetics were not what we were looking to do on this. So now that image is then broken up into a subgrid where the pixels from that image which of course are changing each day, are getting read at runtime, okay? And this, on a dedicated sort of 400 pound graphics card, it flies through and looks really great. This is running off my laptop. Um, so, there, we'll let it sort of finish its thing. So now, it's basically done a procedural generation of geometry that's based off that image, which you can kind of still see the characteristics of the image there remaining. And then as we go in, we actually find ourselves in a real time 3D environment. Again, the aesthetics, the kind of the shape of the buildings, the lights, the aesthetics. We've got a day-night cycle running in here. Like I said, it's do not look at the Look at the aesthetics of that, mm. Jerusalem, and layer into like the different kind of aesthetics of what you see in these other in these other things um, with this particular work here. So uh, looking down on the city, and if we just let this run, it'll eventually cycle the day, and you'll see it better. Um, but basically, what it is, it's all of a sudden that resource has become this real time virtual world, a virtual city that's based off of the process, but then before the process is actually based off that old map. So truly creating an imaginary city from a city that was recorded in, in historic times. So that's so kind those of those constructs are the pixels. Yes, yeah, yeah. Every pixel becomes a building. So um, so yeah the server application basically generates two different sets of images, a high, an ultra high res for things like this, for say print physical work. One of the other things that I'm looking to do, but I don't have any prototypes done yet, is actually uh, laser etching and routing. So, actually, so if you can imagine sort of having a city plan that's been etched out or rounded out um, using those kind of uh, CNC machines, digital process machines. Uh, and then of course we have a lower resolution image because um, in the Unity environment you can basically use a two megapixel image and anything more than that and just that because you're taking from every pixel you're creating a very precise high poly piece of geometry which will then have texturing on top. And then of course you've got various cameras in the world where you can then navigate. We can take this, our plans for this are to do sort of like uh, a multi-screen um, projection setup. So kind of like your hybrid cave system, if you will, can do that. We'll have probably an Oculus version. 
Uh, I've even done sort of Unity stuff in full 360 degree dome environments. I mean, Unity is great for that because you basically author the world and then you sort of tweak your camera, tweak different things, and you can optimize concurrently across different visualization systems. Um, so, Irene, I think she had to leave, but Irene, uh, who, who runs the uh, VNA Digital Design Weekend, a few years ago, one of my other virtual world projects, um, she brought in a we 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 brought in a dome system, a digital dome system, into the VA and got sort of like through through the weekend. I think we got 1,500 people through the dome. It was it was crazy, uh, but yeah. So so you can do some really interesting things in the real time through the environment. Um, yeah. So so anyway, that's kind of the different stuff, but. Please feedback and say, oh, I really like this, or I think this would be more interesting, or have you thought about such and such? Because, again, none of this is finished work. I mean, it's all, it's all prototype. So, so anyway, we'll leave it there. And thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.